Are all philosophical feminists women? By no means. A number of male philosophers have endeavored to both learn and support. Feminism and include feminist subjects in their own more traditional work. These men have published such books as Philosophical Explorations in Light of Feminism, 1992. Edited by Larry May and Robert Strykwerda, Men Doing Feminism, 1998, edited by Tom Digby, and Michael A. Sloat's The Ethics of Care and Empathy, 2007. There were women's separatist social movements in the 1970s. But this has never been a viable option in academia. The radical feminist philosopher of religion Mary Daly, 1936, who taught at Boston College for 33 years, was forced to retire in 1999 for barring men from some of her classes. Daly was always on thin ice at this Jesuit institution. Especially after the publication of her first book, The Church and the Second Sex, 1968. Daly's work is about how men have appropriated the roles and power of women in religion. Particularly in Catholic ritual. Philosophical feminism has evinced strong support for lesbian feminism on the grounds that lesbians have been oppressed in society and that lesbians may recognize the personhood of women more easily than men. Nevertheless, freedom of sexual preference entails that heterosexuality remains a respected preference. Just as freedom of choice in abortion has not led feminists to invalidate on moral or political grounds, pregnancy and childbirth. On motherhood, for example, Sarah Ruddick's maternal thinking. Toward a politics of peace, 1990, shows how child care develops distinctive ways of thinking. Although childbirth and rearing is not limited to heterosexual women. Much of French feminist writing assumes strong male-female sexual differences. Who was Friedrich Nietzsche? Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900, was a brilliant philosophical iconoclast whose devastatingly direct critical writing style might in itself have qualified him as an existentialist. More substantively, though, was how he developed critiques of bourgeois culture, Christianity, empirical reason an altruistic morality from the standpoint of a protesting individual who was grander, smarter, more creative, and in odd ways for a much later readership, hipper than those who championed accepted values of the time. While Dostoevsky and others had criticized modernity in the hope of a return to more conservative religious values, Nietzsche looked ahead to coming generations who would use science as an art to transcend the dreariness of Western history. Why was the single status of early modern men of science and philosophy important? Inevitably, bachelorhood would have had the negative effect of not having long-term 
intimate relationships or much experience with children and family life in adulthood. A bachelor's style of life would have then supported a view of the world from the perspective of a lone individual. And an assumption that the philosophical mind would always have the same gender as oneself. What is moral theory? Moral theory is the intellectual assessment and comparison of different moral or ethical systems. For instance, if we compare consequentialism and deontology, then we are working within moral theory. To some extent, Anyone who argues for their own moral system does some amount of moral theory. For example, Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, in his dismissal of human rights as nonsense upon stilts, wanted to replace discourse about rights with calculations about pleasure. And Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, in distinguishing between hypothetical and categorical judgments and elevating the latter, were both engaged in moral theory. What were some of Newton's career accomplishments? Newton, 1642-1727, was born in Lincolnshire, England, and attended Cambridge University, graduating with A.B. A. in 1665. Between 1665 and 1667, working independently while stuck at home when Cambridge was shut down due to the plague. He discovered the binomial theorem, the fundamentals of calculus. The modern principle of how light was composed, and the basics of his theory of gravity. He held the post of Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge after 1669 and was a fellow of the Royal Society from 1671 to 1703, after which he served as its president for the rest of his life. Newton's system of the world or his unifying theory of mechanics and his mathematical physics was published in Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Who was Henri Bergson? Henry Bergson, 1859 to 1941, was professor at the Collège de France and winner of the 1927 Nobel Prize for Literature. He is most famous for his time and free will. 1889, in which he argued that objective measurable time, which can be divided into equal segments, is not the same as real time, which we experience directly. In Matter and Memory, 1896, he offered a mind body theory consistent with his later work on evolution in which he argued that a creative urge, rather than Darwinian natural selection, is what causes evolution. In an introduction to metaphysics, 1903, he provided further support for his theory of time. In Creative Evolution, 1907, he claimed that a life force is necessary to explain evolution and in two sources of morality and religion, 
1935, he claimed that there are two kinds of society. One free and allowing for reform and creativity, the other stagnant, conservative, and repressive. How else has Boethius been influential long after his death? Erethias, 4 ADC. 525, is best known for his Stoic Neoplatonic text, The Consolation of Philosophy, which he wrote while in prison after having been accused of conspiring with Justinian to overthrow Theodoric. This text was influential throughout the Middle Ages and beyond. It was translated into Anglo-Saxon, German, and French by 1300, and it inspired the writers Dante, Boccaccio, and Chaucer, as well as many, many others. In the Consolation of Philosophy Boethius defined God as eternal, and the complete and perfect sum total of never-ending life. The created universe had no beginning or end, but existed in time. Boethius resolved the contradiction between the fact that God knows everything and the fact that man has free will by claiming that God has a simultaneous understanding of everything that happens in time, including human freedom. What is feminist philosophy of science? Feminist philosophy of science consists of analyses of scientific methodology and standards for truth. Its focus has been on the ways that the idea of objectivity have excluded knowledge of importance to women. Did Vico interact with other Enlightenment thinkers over his lifetime? No. Gyambatis to Vico's circumstances did not afford him the leisure of an intellectual vocation. Outside of Italy, only the German intellectuals such as Johann George Hamann and Johann Gottfried von Herder, knew of his work. Italy was not united during his lifetime. Naples endured constant upheavals as Spain, Austria, and France took it over. Additional political stress resulted from the strength of the Jesuits within the city. Vico's father was a bookseller in Naples. After fracturing his skull as a child, Vico could not attend school for three years, so he read on his own. When he did enroll in university, he proved to be an undisciplined student. He concentrated on logic and medieval scholasticism before settling on law. But, after assisting his own father in a lawsuit in his teens, he never practiced law again. For ten years after 1685, Vico worked as a tutor, reading on his own in philosophy, history, ethics, jurisprudence, and poetry. He did not like mathematics, nor was he particularly interested in science. By the time Vico became professor of rhetoric at the University of Naples in 1695, it was a Cartesian center dedicated to the study of René Descartes' philosophy. 
and Vico was opposed to many aspects of Cartesianism, especially his rationalism. From 1699 to 1708, Vico delivered the beginning lecture for the university every year. Of the essays that developed from those lectures, on the study methods of our time. 1709, was well received for its advocacy of liberal education. This was quickly followed by his 1709 lecture, on the most ancient knowledge of the Italians. In 1722 his three-volume Universal Law was complete, and in 1725 both his autobiography and the new science, which was to be revised in 1730 and 1744, were released. Vico failed to be promoted to chair of civil law and had to write poems and vanity pieces for hire to make a living. He grew bitter and his lifelong melancholy worsened. His death in 1744 followed an agonizing illness. Who are some key feminist philosophers of science? Sandra Harding, 1935, addresses questions of whether women have privileged ways of knowing. In Third World, as well as Euro-American societies, whether the exclusion of women from science can be corrected within science. And whether scientific knowledge is itself misogynistic. What was Philippa Foote's contribution to virtue ethics? Philippa Ruth Foote, 1920, who is the granddaughter of you. S. President Grover Cleveland opposes subjectivism or emotivism in ethics and insists on a connection between morality and rationality. She has tried to undermine a fact-slash-value divide in claiming that moral judgments are determined by facts about our lives and nature. In this sense, she is a moral naturalist. Moral naturalism is the view that what is morally good is not some distinct and special quality but ordinary things and actions that have been rationally chosen as best in a particular set of circumstances. Overall, Foote has consistently supported virtues as conducive to self-interest. Her main publications are Virtues and Vices and Other Essays in Moral Philosophy, 1978 Natural Goodness, 2001, and Moral Dilemmas, and Other Topics in Moral Philosophy, 2002 What were the ideas of the main religious existentialists? Martin Buber, 1878-1965, connected existentialism to Judaism by emphasizing that whereas Christians have direct individual relationships to God, the Jewish relationship to God is mediated by membership in a community. As a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, after he left Vienna in 1938, Buber tried to reconcile Jews and Arabs. 
Buber criticized the subject-object form of knowledge as a mode in both human and religious relationships. In its place, he advocated an I-Thou relationship that recognized the subjectivity of the other. His main work is I and Thou, 1923. Carl Jaspers, 1883-1969, thought that philosophy should help human beings with their projects of self-discovery toward a goal of existence, or authentic selfhood, based on an understanding of one's own life. Although not a traditional theologian, Jaspers nevertheless addressed individual spiritual yearnings. His main works are Philosophy, 1932, On the Origin and Goal of History, 1949, and Way to Wisdom, 1950. Gabriel Marcel, 1889-1973, was both a philosopher and a playwright who addressed human existence in terms of community and personal relationships. He emphasized we are, instead of I am, drawing on both Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, and Buber. He also approached philosophy as a Bergsonian intuitionist by relying on his immediate insights for his views, rather than arriving at them through argument. His main works include Mystery of Being, 1951, and Man Against Mass Society, 1955. His William James Lectures at Harvard University, 1961-1962, were published as The Existential Background of Human Dignity. Simone Weil, 1909-1943, was born into a Jewish Parisian family but converted first to leftist syndicalism, which was a Marxist political movement with the goal of putting labor unions in control of both industry and government. Her subsequent religious thought was a combination of Neoplatonism, Christianity, and Jewish mysticism. She was an activist on behalf of the democratically elected government during the Spanish Civil War and for the French resistance during World War II. She criticized the way in which Marxism had become a religion to some and objected to the dehumanizing effects of capitalism. Her solution was meaningful work as a fundamental human need. Her main writings, published posthumously, are Gravity and Grace, 1947, and Oppression and Liberty, 1955. When did women philosophers first start to become recognized as part of philosophy? Beginning in the early Christian era, the scholarly work and educational activities of at least some women philosophers were recognized. And some male philosophers made special efforts to interact with them intellectually. Did Anselm face objections to his ontological argument? Yes. Also, different forms of Saint Anselm's, 1033-1109, argument kept popping up in the history of philosophy after Anselm died as did different objections to it. It remains a subject of debate in some circles to this day. 
Anselm had posed his argument as something that a fool who did not believe in God, would have to agree with. His contemporary, a monk called Gonilin, took up the position of the fool. Gonilin first said that it was impossible to conceive or imagine a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. Anselm's response was that if the words of being than which nothing greater can be conceived are understood, then one, the fool, has conceived of or imagined this being. And because this being is so great and existence or being is greater than non-existence or non-being, the being exists. What did Wollstonecraft claim on behalf of women? Mary Estelle, 1666-1731, and Elizabeth Elstub, 1683-1756. Preceded Wollstonecraft in arguing for women's recognition as thinking persons. Estelle claimed that women were entitled to be educated. Her reason for this was that women had the same God-given capacity to reason as men. Her justification for educating women was that this could help them be better wives and mothers. Wollstonecraft shared Estelle's views and defended them more systematically. She also claimed that the current treatment of privileged women as spaniels and toys was demeaning to them. She took Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, to task for claiming in his hugely popular novel Emile. 1762, that women should be educated to provide soothing pleasure to men. She wrote openly about female sexuality and the emotional vulnerability of women to rakes. Arguing that women were educated to be impulsive, emotional, and gullible. How important was Joseph Marie de Maester? In his Freedom and Its Betrayal, philosopher and historian Isaiah Berlin. 1909-1997, listed de Maester as a major opponent to liberty in the Enlightenment. In the 19th century, French literary critic Émile Faguet, 1847-1916, described de Maester as a fierce absolutist. A furious theocrat, an intransigent legitimist, apostle of a monstrous trinity composed of Pope, King and Hangman, always and everywhere the champion of the hardest, narrowest, and most inflexible dogmatism. A dark figure out of the Middle Ages, part learned doctor, part inquisitor, part executioner. Who was F. H. Bradley? Francis Herbert, F. H. Bradley, 1846-1924, was a main architect of 19th-century British idealism. But he was also highly influential as an intuitionist. His principal work was Ethical Studies, 1876. 
in which he sought to explain how morality can be part of individual consciousness and social institutions. He argued that individuals believe that morality is an intrinsic value, which, depending on their social status, they self-realize in their actions. Good selves could be actualized only if bad selves were suppressed. Therefore, the good self requires the bad self and morality can never be completely actualized unless oneself dies through surrender to Christianity. Why did Martin Heidegger refuse having his works translated from the German language? Heidegger had a strong bias in favor of German as the language of thought. He did not think that his philosophy could be understood by those who did not speak German and would not permit his work to be translated into Spanish. Who was Leibniz? Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, 1646-1715, was a German philosopher, scientist, mathematician, and historian famous for his metaphysical idealism as well as his epistemological rationalism. In addition, he made contributions to the fields of astronomy, biology, including embryology, engineering, information technology, law, logic medicine, paleontology, philology, sinology, social science, and topology. The calculating machine he invented could add, subtract, and calculate square roots. His plans for invading Egypt are said to have been used by Napoleon. Leibniz also kept up a voluminous correspondence throughout his life. What did Maurice Merleau-Ponty mean by a phenomenology of perception? Merleau-Ponty opposed the abstract natures of both empiricism, which generalized, and idealism, which denied the direct experience and existence of physical reality. He proclaimed that the perceiving mind is an incarnate mind. Meaning that it was in the body in the sense of being coincident with the body. Perception is a physical process involving eyes, ears, the nose, the hands, rather than only the mind. His focus was thus on the human body as a perceiving, living part of world a position theretofore much neglected in philosophical inquiry. According to Merleau-Ponty, perception is neither abstract nor scientific. Rather, all perception is lived, it is the experience of human beings in the world. Consciousness is, to use a later term, embodied and always engaged in perceiving the world. What is phenomenological about human experience is that what is perceived cannot be separated from how it is perceived or from how it is described. In conversation with Ferdinand de Saussure, 1857-1913, Merleau-Ponty composed the prose of the world. 1969 claiming that meaning is not determined by history but by the subject's actual experience in the world. 
language is itself continually changing as a result of this experience. In the visible and the invisible Merleau-Ponty had intended to show how communication and thought can go beyond perception, but he died before completing that project. Was Jonathan Edwards merciful toward sinners? Not in the least. Jonathan Edwards thought that many humans were depraved and that a real hell awaited them. There is a tone of delight in these facts in his 1741 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards not only believed that sinners would be punished, but that God himself had no pity for their agony. He wrote, If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case, or showing you the least regard or favor, that instead of that, he will only tread you underfoot. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy, he will crush out your blood, and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on his garments, so as to stain all his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. And, insofar as the virtuous strive to emulate God, Edwards felt it is fitting that they enjoy the suffering of such sinners in hell. In 1758, in his Why Saints in Glory Will Rejoice to See the Torments of the Damned, Edwards wrote, when they shall see how miserable others of their fellow creatures are, who were naturally in the same circumstances with themselves. When they shall see the smoke of their torment, and the raging of the flames of their burning, and hear their dolorous shrieks and cries, and consider that they in the meantime are in the most blissful state, and shall surely be in it to all eternity, how will they rejoice? What was the intellectual merit of Dasada's endeavors? Dasada was elected to the National Convention in 1790 and wrote political pamphlets calling for a direct vote. Simone de Beauvoir, 1908-1986 and other 20th century existentialists interpreted a radical doctrine of freedom in his writings. His emphasis on the importance of sexuality in human life is said to have anticipated Sigmund Freud. Others have seen seeds of nihilism in his work. The 20th century psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan claimed that de Sada's ethics were a counterpart to Immanuel Kant's 1724-1804 categorical imperative. The 20th century feminist Andrea Dworkin, 1946-2005 Analyzed de Sada to illustrate the inherently violent misogynistic nature of all heterosexual pornography. Who were some of Robert Boyle's scientific influences?
Pierre Gassendi, 1592-1655, and Walter Charlton, 1619-1707, influenced Boyle. In 1656 Charlton brought Gassendi's ideas about atoms to England with his Physiologia Epicuro Gassendo Chartania. Or, a fabric of science natural, upon the hyopthesis of atoms. Founded by Epicurus, repaired by Petrus Gassendus, augmented by Walter Charlton, 1654. Charlton revised Gassendi's view that everything, including the soul, was made up of material atoms. This view entailed that the soul was a physical thing, which was against the beliefs of most theologians and members of the clergy. Was Jean-Paul Sartre Jewish? This question is deeply embedded in the disputes among Sartre's closest followers that followed his death. Their disputes were not so much matters of philosophy as they were a competition. For who would inherit Sardi's legacy and be able to speak for him after his death? According to Benny Levy, a former Maoist who had been Sartre's secretary for several years and transcribed 40 hours of taped conversations in Hope Now. The 1980 interviews, 1996, Sartre expressed hope for the coming of the Messiah. Was Kierkegaard cursed? Kierkegaard had a self-fulfilling way of being cursed. There was not only the matter of Rajin Olsen after he broke off his engagement. He spent the rest of his life tormented by her loss. There was also the Corsair affair of 1845 to 1846, when, after an unfavorable review, he wrote the following in dialectical result of a literary police action, with a paper like the Corsair, which hitherto has been read by many and all kinds of people and essentially has enjoyed the recognition of being ignored despised, and never answered. The only thing to be done in writing in order to express the literary, moral order of things reflected in the inversion that this paper with meager competence and extreme effort has sought to bring about was for someone immortalized and praised in this paper to make application to be abused by the same paper. May. I ask to be abused the personal injury of being immortalized by the Corsair is just too much. And abused he was, in a campaign so bitingly satiric and mocking of all his personal weaknesses and defects he was short and frail. And had been born with a hump on his back that he described. Himself as apprehensive of everyone with whom he came into contact, even the butcher boy. This was not self-indulgent paranoia because Kierkegaard experienced the modern phenomenon of a celebrity degraded by the gutter press everywhere he walked in Copenhagen. It was a catastrophe for him because walking and talking to people in all stations of life had been his principal diversion. When and how did the scientific revolution begin?
The scientific revolution began with Nicolaus Copernicus, 1473-1543. Heliocentric theory and the rediscovery of ancient Greek atomism in the 15th and 16th centuries. But it was not until the end of the 17th century, after Isaac Newton's, 1643-1727, work that it was clear to educated people in Europe that a full-blown scientific revolution had occurred. Was Copernicus' new theory purely scientific? No because there was considerable mysticism in his astronomical ideas. Consider these two passages from his De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelesium Libri 4. Finally we shall place the Sun himself at the center of the universe. All this is suggested by the systematic procession of events and the harmony of the whole universe. If only we face the facts, as they say, with both eyes open. And, at rest, however, in the middle of everything is the sun. In what ways did William Wool disagree with Immanuel Kant? Wuhl disagreed with Kant, 1724-1804, in not limiting the number of fundamental ideas. And claiming that we can have objective knowledge of the world as it exists in itself, independently of our fundamental ideas. Kant, on the other hand, held that we cannot know things as they are in themselves but only things as our categories enable us to understand them. Wuhl posited God as the creator of our fundamental ideas. Because God had created them, these ideas matched reality. Is Hegel's system purely abstract? Very abstract thinking is necessary to understand Hegel's system. But the system itself is presented by him as a literal account of reality. Categories are at the outset literally embedded in physical nature, which expresses them. Space expresses a lower category of being. Whereas living organisms embody and express the higher categories of concept, purpose, and life. Thus, the development of the system of thought is evident in the development of the real world. Except that thought, or the absolute, is the ultimately real actualizing and defining principle of everything that exists. What is philosophy of film? Film criticism, both scholarly and popular, has a history as long as visual media. But philosophy of film, as a contemporary subfield in aesthetics. Or philosophy of art, dates from the 1970s. As in other fields, the philosophy of film is similar to the theory of film undertaken by specialists in film or film studies. There are philosophers who, 
like film theorists and critics, specifically study film as a self-contained medium. Philosophical cultural critics who use film as evidence of broad beliefs in contemporary culture. And philosophers who turn to film for examples in ethics, aesthetics. Political philosophy, feminism, and many other philosophical interests and subfields. As well, some films directly raise philosophical questions. Such as the questions about what is real in The Matrix, 1999, and its sequels, and the nature of memory and identity raised by Memento. 2000, and the children's film The Never Ending Story, 1984. There are, moreover, films that are directly about philosophy and philosophers such as the Easter. 2004, which is about Martin Heidegger, 1889-1976. Contemporary sources on philosophy and film include, Richard Allen and Murray Smith, editors. Film Theory and Philosophy, 1997, Gregory Curry, Image and Mind, Film, Philosophy and Cognitive Science. 1995, and Cynthia A. Freeland and Thomas E. Wartenberg, Philosophy and Film, 1995. The online journal Film Philosophy, a philosophical review of film studies and World Cinema is an ongoing source of contemporary work and additional sources. Was Hegel a political radical or a romantic? Friedrich Hegel was not a radical in his mature writings in which he praised the status quo. But in his youth, perhaps he was. At 18 he began studies at the Stift Theological Seminary in Tübingen. But he was bored by the course of study and sermons. Preferring to read Aristotle, Spinoza, Voltaire, and Rousseau. Nevertheless, he was a good student, earning a PhD by 20 and a theological certificate three years later. His peers called him old man when he accompanied them in hiking, beer drinking, and carousing. They were all excited by the French Revolution. And in 1792 Hegel was called the most enthusiastic speaker of freedom and equality in a student club that was devoted to the study of Plato. Kant, and F. H. Jacobi. Hegel's roommates were the poet. Christian Friedrich Holderlin and the philosopher Friedrich Schelling, 1775-1854 From Holderlin he learned to love the ancient Greeks even more. They all protested against the political and ecclesiastical stasis of Tübingen. On July 14, 1792, Hegel, Holderlin, and Schelling were said to have planted a liberty tree on a meadow near the Tübingen Seminary, although not all biographers think this in fact happened. Hegel was hardly a romantic philosopher, but there was some romantic drama in his life. As he was finishing the Phenomenology of Spirit, 1807, Christina Burkhardt informed him that she was pregnant with their child. Ludwig, his illegitimate son, was born in February 1807. He completed the manuscript on the same day Napoleon Bonaparte captured Jena, October 18, 1807, in 18 LL. 
At the age of 41, he married Marie von Tucher, who was 20. Marie's aristocratic family was not enthusiastic about the match. Though, and a government official friend had to intervene to negotiate it. During their courtship, Hegel wrote her a romantic poem, which most describe as hackneyed. He referred to his hope of marrying her as an ascension into eternal bliss. Did Asclepigenia suffer the same fate as Hypatia? No. Asclepigenia of Athens, 430-485, taught Neoplatonism in her father's school. She applied knowledge of Plato and Aristotle to Christian moral questions. Proclus, 412-485, was one of her students. Asclepigenia's main interests appear to have been in mysticism, magic, and other mysteries. What were the emotional conditions in Sren Kierkegaard's life? Kierkegaard's father, Michael, was a very gloomy man who had married a former mate as a second wife. He felt himself under a cloud of God's wrath and expected punishment through his children predeceasing him five of them did. The sins of Kierkegaard's father apparently consisted of his having impregnated his wife before they were married and in cursing God during severe weather as a ten-year-old shepherd. He later became well off as a wool merchant. Kierkegaard was sickly as a boy but he could reduce larger boys to tears with his sarcasm and mockery. At the University of Copenhagen, he did not find Hegelianism congenial because it did not address a truth. Which is true for me, to find the idea for which I can live and die. The religion of Lutheranism did not speak to him, either and for a while he indulged in expensive food and drink and wore fashionable clothes. Because he believed that immediate pleasure was the most important thing. But his father's despair haunted him and became his own. Kierkegaard was intending to become a pastor when he became engaged to Regine Olsen in 1841 he had met her when she was 14, three years earlier, and they were deeply in love. But Kierkegaard broke off the engagement, and she subsequently married her tutor. Frederick Schlegel, who became governor of the Danish West Indies. An original life's path was taking shape for Kierkegaard. And when he decided not to marry he also decided not to become a Lutheran pastor. Kierkegaard believed that philosophy was neither about system building nor analysis. But rather the expression of individual existence. He had no respect for professors because he did not think. There was any way they could comprehend his subjectivity. Kierkegaard's most important works were all written in the 1840s, either slash or, a fragment of life. 1843, Fear and Trembling, 1843, The Concept of Dread, 1844, Philosophical Fragments. 
1844, concluding unscientific postscript, 1846, and the sickness unto death, 1849. His autobiographical writings and journals shed considerable light on his personal thoughts and feelings. Nonetheless, it was not his intention to disclose everything. He wrote, After my death no one will find among my papers a single explanation as to what really filled my life. That is my consolation, no one will find the words which explain everything and which often made what the world would call a trifle into an event of tremendous importance to me. And what I look upon as something insignificant when I take away the secret gloss which explains it all. When Kierkegaard was near death he refused a pastor's sacrament, remarking. Pastors are royal officials, royal officials have nothing to do with Christianity. His epitaph read, as he had requested, that individual. Which of the other Enlightenment thinkers were most directly relevant to philosophy? Among the other Enlightenment thinkers of note in the area of philosophy is Mary Wollstonecraft. 1759-1797, the mother of Frankenstein novelist Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. She contributed the foundations for feminist thought. Her husband was anarchist and political philosopher William Godwin. 1756-1836, known for his determinist utilitarianism. The French philosophes, particularly the encyclopedists. Contributed radical ideas about society and government. Voltaire, François-Marie Rouet, 1694-1778, brought key philosophical ideas to a wider audience. Enlightenment thought in general had a powerful effect on the American. Colonies and the establishing principles of the United States of America. What was Johann Gottlieb Fichte's political philosophy? In his Foundations of Natural Right, 1796, he supported individualism, but his views changed over time. His Speeches to the German Nation, 1808 advocated concern for the common good and condemned selfish acts. He argued that egoism was untenable, morally, but that the German people could rise to a higher level because of the innate excellence of their character and language. What happened in analytic philosophy of science over the course of the 20th century? The 20th century was an extraordinary period of conceptual upheaval in how science was regarded. There was a rejection of hardcore logical positivism, beginning with Hans Reichenbach, 1891-1953 Just as metaphysics and epistemology drew closer to the actual sciences 
philosophy of science itself began to look more humanistic as traditional inductive confidence in objective facts was first dislodged by Karl Popper. 1902-1994, Thomas S. Kuhn, 1922-1996 then inverted the relationship between facts and theories with his notion of a paradigm and scientific revolutions. Over the same time period, any lingering hopes in vitalism or some non-objective life force were put to rest by James D. Watson and Francis Crick's discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. However, the mapping of the human genome at the turn of the 21st century did provoke more nuanced views on biological determinism, opening the possibility of a new philosophy of science of biology. What was Bentham's principle of utility? Jeremy Bentham intended it to guide legislators for the sake of reforming the legal system. He thought that legislators were too influenced by the principle of sympathy and antipathy, which he called ipsedixitism. They punished what they did not like, even if, as in the case of sexual transgressions, no one was harmed and they failed to punish sources of great suffering. Bentham wanted legal obligations to be based on the goal of increasing happiness and lessening pain and suffering. This was his principle of utility. With this principle, no other value was necessary, and legal fictions could be abolished. Concerning rights, Bentham believed that they were nonsense upon stilts. What did George Berkeley think of the distinction between primary and secondary qualities? Seventeenth-century empirical philosophers believed that secondary qualities are what we perceive namely colors, sounds, textures, and smells. They thought that primary qualities like mass and number were the qualities of atoms that made up objects. We can't perceive primary qualities, but the seventeenth-century empiricists held that it is the Interaction between the primary qualities of atoms that cause our perception of secondary qualities. For example, the atoms in red paint interact with our eyes, through light, to cause the experience of red. But Berkeley denied that there was a distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Because it is impossible to have an idea of a primary quality such as mass, extension, size, or number without also having an idea of its color, texture, or other secondary qualities. How was Vico's thought opposed to the Enlightenment? Vico's main thesis was, the order of ideas follows the order of things. The Enlightenment thesis, by contrast, was, the order of things follows the order of ideas. That is, Vico thought that ideas are the result of physical reality. Whereas Enlightenment optimists held that reality can be directed by reason. Also, 
Vico believed in a cyclical progression of human events. Whereas an overarching faith of the Enlightenment was in the existence of progress, which meant real change. Who was Karl Popper? Sir Karl Raymond Popper, 1902-1994, is well known for his insistence that it be necessary to be able to say what would make scientific claims false. He was born in Austria and grew up near Ludwig Wittgenstein. 1889-1951, in Vienna, Austria, but not under wealthy circumstances. He had to leave Germany in the late 1930s. And after teaching in New Zealand he was a professor at the London School of Economics. Popper is as famous for his philosophy of science as for his political thought. Which he developed in the Open Society and its Enemies, 1945, 5th Revised Edition, 1965. What was al kindis main contribution to philosophy? Abu Yusuf al kindi c. 800-850, known in Latin as al kindus had both a noble heritage and an important position in the caliphate. The governing body representing Islamic leaders, headed by the Caliph. He promoted the introduction of Western philosophy into the Arabic world. With a focus on Plato and Aristotle. Unlike his successors, he believed that there was a literal correspondence. Between the metaphysical writings of the ancient Greeks and parts of the Churan. His work was closer to Neoplatonism than Aristotelianism. And the tradition he began is contrasted by scholars to that of Mata Y. B. Anianus, d. 940, who founded a school of Aristotelianism in Baghdad. Who was Eric Fromm? Eric Fromm, 1900-1980, established his reputation in political psychology with Escape from Freedom. 1941, which was a condemnation of authoritarian societies. His Art of Loving was an international bestseller in 1956. His distinction between different types of love in that work was a revelation to some Western readers. Fromm drew on the Talmud to extol individuality and criticize totalitarianism. Many of his readers were inspired by his combination of Marxism with psychoanalysis in a way that respected individuality. Did Plato change his philosophy as he grew older? Plato became more conservative in his outlook and more attentive to existing social values and traditions as he aged. The city of the Republic would have required a revolution to set up. In the later laws, 
Plato becomes less revolutionary and describes a second best city in which there are traditional families and rulers are elected, rather than specially bred. In the Parmenids Plato offers a series of criticisms to his earlier theory of forms, which he is apparently unable to answer and which are later taken up by Aristotle. The most famous of these is the third man argument. Suppose we discover a form that accounts for what makes similar things similar. For example, every cat is different. But all cats share the same catness because they participate in the cat form. Now, if we compare this form with any one thing that participates in it in this case. Compare your cat with the cat form the form and the participating. Thing will have similarities that make it necessary to posit a second form. If we then make comparisons of the cat to the second form, a third form will need to be posited, and on and on and on to an infinite regress. That is, Plato was aware of the theoretical problems with his theory of forms. What was the goal of the encyclopedists? The goal of the encyclopedists was to gather together in a collection of contemporary volumes, everything known at the time in all fields. Their main contributors were Denis Diderot, 1713 to 1784, Jean L. E. Ron D'Alembert, 1717 to 1783, Baron Paul Henry Dietrich D. Holbach, 1723 to 1789, and Charles Louis de Secondat, Baron de Labre D. T. de Montesquieu, 1689 to 1755, as well as Jean Jacques Rousseau. 1712 to 1778 and Voltaire 1694 to 1778 Their work was humanistic and scientifically inclined However its anti-clerical themes resulted in royal censorship in 1750 Although the project endured until 1777 there were 140 contributors and almost 150 additional writers and engravers to the project. The 32 volumes produced had more than 70,000 entries, with 11 volumes of plates and 21 of printed text. What was Peter Lombard's contribution to medieval philosophy? Peter Lombard, c. 1095-1160, was an Italian theologian who wrote the Book of Sentences. He was educated in Bologna, Reims, and Paris, and he taught at Notre Dame. Becoming a canon there from 1144 to 1145. What have been the two main subjects of Western philosophy? Western philosophy has always had two main subjects, the natural world and the human world. The natural world includes nature, physical reality, and the cosmos. The human world includes human beings, their values, experience. 
minds, ethics, societies, government, cultures, and human nature itself. Philosophy of course occurs in all cultures and daily life. But Western philosophy is a distinct way of thinking that consists of hypotheses and generalizations. About what philosophers believe is important in the natural and human worlds. Western philosophers have not been focused on stories of the origins of peoples nor on events in time. Like historians, and neither are they focused on individual lives, like biographers. Instead, they have sought to view events and lives in general and abstract ways. That can tell us what is true of categories or kinds of events, and individual lives. What was W? V. O. Quine's attack on the analytic synthetic distinction. In Two Dogmas of Empiricism, published in the journal The Philosophical Review, 1951. Quine began with the accepted view that analytic statements are true based only on the meaning of the words they contain. There is nothing in the world that can affect the truth of an analytic statement. Synthetic statements are factual claims about the world. Quine then showed how it is impossible to define analyticity without a prior notion of sameness of meaning that itself presupposes analyticity. What this means is that unless you already know what analytic means you will not understand any definition of it. Or that analytic cannot be defined without circularity. If we do not know what analyticity is, there is a strong implication that for all practical purposes all of our beliefs are in some sense synthetic and subject to revision based on experience. The second dogma of empiricism that Quine attacked in the same article was the prevailing view that statements in a theory all face reality one by one. Quine claimed that all of the statements face reality together. Here, Quine meant that a whole theory or account of the world gets confirmed at once. Rather than parts of the theory being confirmed separately. How can there be new philosophy? Western philosophy began during the 7th century B. C. so it's a good question how there can be anything new in the field. Toward the end of the 20th century, philosophy began a revitalization by adding fields and reconfiguring. Old problems. Some of the subjects added had originated in philosophy, developed as other disciplines and then returned to philosophy so that philosophers could sort out the real intellectual issues. Feminism, environmentalism, and to some extent studies of race all fall under this category. As does cognitive science and new philosophies of psychology and biology. Post-structuralism, or deconstructionism, which is also known as postmodern philosophy. Always was considered philosophy in Europe. But it has only recently been recognized as such at philosophy departments in American universities. So called other philosophies from Latin America, Asia, 
and Africa have also begun to achieve recognition in the United States. There has been a revival of pragmatism, too. Brand new on the horizon is experimental philosophy. There is, in addition, a new philosophy of biology, philosophy of film and television. Philosophy of technology, and philosophy for children, not to mention the new Mr. Ianism. What was impressive about Averro's life and work? Averroes, c. 1126 c. 1198, was born into a prominent family of lawyers and judges. And was himself trained as a lawyer in both civil and religious affairs. He traveled from Cordoba to Marrakesh in 1153 and decided that Aristotle had been correct in stating that the world was round when he was able to observe Canope, a star not visible in Spain. He served as both advisor and doctor to the Sultan of Marrakesh who encouraged a series of commentaries on Aristotle. His writings include treatises on medicine and astronomy, but he is best known for his The Incoherence of Incoherence, which was a reply to Al-Ghazali's, 1058-1111, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. In his Incoherence of Incoherence, Averroes defended natural reason as a means to attain knowledge in all domains. By natural reason Averroes, and others after him, meant ordinary thought processes rather than religious intuition or revelation. Averroes also wrote a set of commentaries on Aristotle. That was influential in Western medieval scholarship. When his interpretations of Aristotle did not square with his own assumptions, he wrote detailed supplements of his own. For example, Aristotle's Physics and On the Heavens were composed as two separate works and based on different types of observations. Under Plato's influence, Averroes assumed that they were united. Who was Michel Foucault? Michel Foucault, 1926-1984, was an acclaimed French philosopher, who also had French licenses in psychology and psychopathology. His father and both grandfathers were medical doctors. And the ways in which he analyzed European culture, through an archaeology of concepts, probably owes as much to medical diagnostic methodology as it does to continental intellectual criticism. His principal works are his published dissertation, Madness and Unreason. A History of Madness in the Classical Age, 1961, The Birth of the Clinic, 1963. The Order of Things, 1966, The Archaeology of Knowledge, 1969, Discipline and Punish. The Origin of the Prison, 1975, and the Multivolume History of Sexuality, 1974. The Order of Things was a bestseller in France, leading to his worldwide fame. In that book, 
Foucault argued that sciences do not simply pop up as sources of truth on their own, but require prior ideas of human nature and truth in order to be supported and accepted as sciences.